much today. I just want to start by quickly just highlighting the lack of Latinos in, uh, as professors throughout this country, and especially within the STEM field. Uh, you can see here, when it comes to professors in the United States, in the fall of 2016, a mere five percent were Latinos, and that number falls even more when you look at full tenured professors, where you have only three percent. Uh, without a doubt, there is an utter lack of representation of Latinos when it comes to professorships in the United States, and that is found without a doubt here at Villanova as well. Uh, as you can see, when it comes to the university as a whole, we have a mere 3.2 percent of our professors who are Latinos, uh, and without a doubt, white professors have the massive majority when it comes to professors here at Villanova, as I said. So now, just kind of briefly, uh, this is an idea and a topic that is in the news. Uh, there is, people are coming to this kind of understanding that there is very little diversity when it comes to uh, professors throughout the United States. And while it is a topic that is starting to be discussed more and more, the numbers are not really changing. The numbers are not reflecting this. Uh, and that is seen here at Villanova and throughout the country, as I just showed. But now I'm going to turn the floor over to our panelists, because while we all know that this is a massive issue and one that needs to be addressed, I would like them to kind of share light, or shed light on what this uh, atmosphere does for the team of both professors and students, professionals as well. Uh, and I would like to turn the floor over to them by beginning with the question, the third one actually on this list. What are some of the advantages of becoming a professor versus a professional? And how does being a Latino affect uh, the decision, that decision? And if you could share some personal examples, that would be wonderful. Well, I can tell you what the advantage of being a professor is, which is awesome. <laughs> Listen, you get to do what you want, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you got to teach and do research, but that's what you sign up for. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah. It's uh, better with a microphone. What? It is. It's better with a microphone. Hello. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to be really like the speaker of Jane the Virgin. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you get to uh, do whatever you want in terms of research, in terms of teaching. You have job security. Uh, where else? Yeah, unless you don't get to wear those funny robes that the Supreme Court wears, but other than that, you have the safest job in. United States, and you are your own boss, and you are above the median for salary, all of us we are, so being a professor is awesome. Yeah. You go ahead and I'll, I'll follow you. Hello. Um, so I just wanted to add a, a couple of things uh, to what uh, Diego uh, said. I think well, I don't uh, do uh, research like I think uh, most of uh, uh, you guys uh, do. I'm um, mostly a teaching professor. But one of the advantages for me um, is like because we are always uh, working with a different crop of students. That how, that's how it's always uh, new and fresh uh, to me, the new challenges that come in with the different uh, uh, classes that I get uh, uh, each year. Even though it is still teaching, but you guys make, uh, make it fresh uh, and still uh, relevant and, and important for us. And another thing that I like about um, uh, being a professor versus being a professional, and my husband is uh, also uh, a chemist, and he is uh, on the professional side, so I see uh, uh, differences between what I do and he does. And uh, one difference uh, is that I have a little bit more flexibility on how my day uh, can be, depending on uh, several obligations that I may have uh, here or personal obligations. I can uh, always uh, I have to be here for my teaching and my uh, meeting with the students and office hours and all of that, but if there is a pressing matter, you can always uh, decide when uh, you're going to uh, do your prep uh, if you have to uh, go elsewhere for uh, any any other uh, problem or situation that uh, you may have. So you do have a little bit more of a flexibility uh, if uh, there is an emergency, uh, emergency or something like that, that maybe if you're uh, working for uh, a company, uh, that may not necessarily be the case. Um, so um, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, hello. Yeah, I'm going to add something to that, and then I'll, I'll try to answer the second question. How does being a, a Latino factor into it? Um, but 
One thing that, uh, just following up on that, one thing that I find that it's really, really awesome about being a professor is that you're, you're working in a university. And in a university, you have a lot of events that happen usually. Um, so you're always challenging yourself intellectually to learn more, to explain things better, to meet new students, to try to um, show them why the stuff that you teach is cool. Um, you can go to events that are organized by other departments, by other colleges. But, so you're always kind of like learning, being challenged intellectually. And that, if you, if you like to learn, there's really no better place to be than a university. Um, so so that's, that's really awesome. My wife also works in industry. She works for a medical device company, and she's a supervisor. So her day is goes by, you know, her day goes by telling people kind of like what to do and solving issues because this law didn't pass a quality statistics uh, based uh, um, a test, and 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 then they have to sort of like figure out what to do. But it's not just managing people and kind of like working with that. Um, so so in that sense. Intellectually, I, I love my job. Sort of like that's that's awesome. How does being a Latino play into it? Um, I think that that's a place where um, I I find, for example, my wife that works in industry. There's several Latinos that work with her, and they form a community and they go out to lunch together. And they're always talking and they're always kind of like um, uh, you know forming that community that's, that's really helpful at work. Um, so that is something that depending on where you work, you might not have that, right? So, so I guess there are numbers of Latino faculty at universities and Latino faculties at Villanova and whatnot. So, so if you want to find a community of, of people that have similar backgrounds than you or, or are also Latinos or whatnot, that is harder to find, I guess, in, 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 in the university. So um, people take that in different ways. Um, Sometimes that's positive that you do get to meet and you get to go out of your comfort zone and get to meet other people and, and create other friendships. But there are times that you do want to be able to say, well, um, I don't know, I want to eat the stuff of food that I was raised eating and I don't find that here. And I want to um, go to an event where the music is the sort of music that I grew up um, listening and things like that, that that you do miss. So so that that plays a little bit into, into that cultural side. Um, there are other issues that maybe I'll talk about later and not now that, that it's about um, why is it that they're not as many, but, but maybe I don't, I, I'm not going to talk about that at this point. It's not related to this question. So, um. so I'm going to make a comment about the third question. Of what is, why do you want to be a professor? And uh, as Alejandro, as all the panelists are saying, it's because it's fun. I mean, that's what we all want to do. You want to have fun at, at work. And um and it's challenging, so uh, you don't get bored. And um, a little bit of my my story. So when I was starting engineering, I, I went for an internship in a company, solar panel. It was really fun the first two months, but after two months, I realized that all the projects were done in the same way. Um, I didn't want that in my life. I, I was 22 years old. I never want to do that. So uh, when you join a university and you choose to do research or teaching. As uh, we were saying, every day is a new day. Every day is full of challenges, new students, new research topics, and you don't get bored. So that's actually one of the, my main motivations. It's challenging. It's true, because you need to get funding. You need to uh, make sure the students learn and all that. But I think it's worth it. And um, it also gives you flexibility. And uh, my wife is also a faculty at UPenn, and we just had a baby. So, for example, we're trying to coordinate our agendas for next semester when our uh, paternities and maternity days are over. And I could not imagine that uh, if we both work in a company. But we work in academia, and we can actually, with the help of our departments, to um, schedule our classes so that to make sure that uh, our schedules uh, don't overlap, so that we can take care of the baby if he gets sick. So that's another uh, possibility. And. Uh, Related to the question that Alejandro was saying, um, uh, what is the advantage of being a Latino? Or what is the plus of being a Latino and being a professor? So I think that, um, as you know, Latinos person are, are considered warm personalities, right? And as a professor, you are uh, in contact with students, you're in contact with other faculty, you have to network and all that. And I think that's something that comes natural with your uh, personality as a, as a Latino. So I think it's something that I, I see as an advantage more than 
more than something that is on your back. Also, so you all addressed a lot of things about being a professor uh, and kind of traits that make that such an exciting career. Is there anything regarding the research that you do? I know you mentioned what you do as Muslim, but is there anything regarding your research where you feel that your Latino identity has really influenced the way that you view a specific problem or the way you approach a certain uh, topic? Uh, do you think that that plays into the way that you conduct your research outside of the class? Um, I, I do research in mathematics, which um, there are a couple of mathematicians, at the very least here, statisticians. Uh, so, so the topics that I that I work on um, are not necessarily re related to culture and 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 um, things where being a Latino might play a big role in it. So, so I guess no, it, it doesn't affect as much the research per se, but it does affect my approach to working with people. Um, so, so where I come from, as, as David mentioned, um, we, we come from a place that's very warm, that you're taught to include people, that if your neighbor doesn't have food, you provide food. Um, if your neighbor doesn't have something, you provide that. Um, so, and, and I guess now moving here, I moved to North Indiana, where, where I barely met my neighbor in the five years I was living there. And, and it's, a, like, it's, a, it's just a different different culture, I guess. Um, so, so when I work on research, particularly with other with collaborators, I make sure that I, that I reach towards them or with students, that I, that I tell them, okay, I'm here if you need me, or let's talk about it, or so, so, I'm, so I'm here for you, and, and I hope that you're there for me too. So, like, so that cultural aspect does play a role in, in how I approach research. Also, I would like to add, and also when, when you're treating with your students, you're doing research, you have your PhD student, master students, undergrad doing research. The way you care about them uh, is also related to how you feel your Latino uh, personality, right? I mean, it's something that you can just meet with them once a week for half an hour, and then they're done. I mean, you really care. I mean, I feel, um, so I, I talk, I mean, when I, they asked me, why are you coming here to campus if you're on paternity leave? And I said, I have a scientific baby. So I have one at home, but I have also one scientific baby here, which is my PhD student. I have to take her off, right? And uh, so this is a joke, but uh, that's how I feel. I mean, he's an uh, uh, international student, and, and he's pursuing his research here. So I feel that I'm responsible for his success uh, as a person and as a researcher as well. Um, that's, and I forgot what I was going to say, but... So my short answer is no. <laughs> my longer answer is that, it, so I'm in the psychological and brain sciences department, uh, and I think for me it goes the other in the other direction in the sense that the research and the knowledge that we acquired in social psychology has over the years informed uh, my conception of what it means to be Latino. And I think there's quite clear evidence, this is going to be a mini, mini tutorial in social psychology, of a couple of things. One is that uh, race is culturally constructed. We, we know that for a fact. Um, and that we can, and there is in-group, out-group. So we're talking about Latinos, but I'll just ask you, so tell me, Alexander, where are you from? I don't know, I'm from Argentina. I'm from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. So, what kind of music do you listen to? Uh, salsa, merengue, bachata, reggaeton. Well, so, I listen to those things now because my kids go to high school and that's the music that they put on an Alexa, but that's not what I would be listening to. Uh, it's different, it's different, right? So, what kind of food? Do you guys eat spicy food? Um, not spot. I mean, it's not hot food, but it does have flavor, so it's sort of like it does have a lot of spice. Plátano macho. There. You're missing the plátano macho. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where are you from? Though? From Spain. Okay, so probably I have, uh, when it comes to the food that I eat, more in common with David than uh, with Alexander, because I'm from Buenos Aires, where it has a lot of immigrants from Spain and Italy and the food is very influenced in there. We never eat any spicy food. The point here is less about what food or what music we eat, uh, we, we prefer, but that um, 
we all come from different regions of the world. And uh, you might, there's sometimes a tendency of thinking, well, Latinos. Um, in Argentina, we used to say, uh, shankies go home. By that we meant Americans go home, right? Because everybody was shanky. But here you wouldn't say Yankee. I mean, you wouldn't call somebody from Mississippi a Yankee. Uh, so there's this in-group, out-group, where we tend to think that the outside group is homogeneous uh, and the in-group is much more heterogeneous. And so for me, it's, it's not that important, I guess, the... The, this label of, of being Latino. I mean, it's funny, we were starting talking here, and we weren't really talking about our cultures, we were talking about David's kid and parabolas, and so you have all sort of different ways. <laughs> we were, weren't we? I mean, I brought it up. Um, so the point is, there's all sort of things that you can find, uh, make groups of. Uh, yeah, one of them is ethnic, origin, or if you want to call it race, call it race, and, and that's fine. But there are many others, and I think it's a matter of, of individual preferences of which of those you might, you might favor, and you might favor different ones, you know, Monday and Tuesday, and then Wednesday and Thursday you go by some other <laughs> things, right, or in different environments. Um, I just wanted to add uh, something maybe a little bit different, but still uh, related to being a Latino um, or Latina uh, professor um, at uh, you know in a college setting. It it makes me full of pride when I the first day of school when I say my name and it's the Wilma Febo Ayala. It's like you know I don't even try to make it sound a little bit English uh, and I write it on the board hoping that because I know a lot of uh, my students uh, actually have taken some uh, Spanish so that they'll, they'll be able to uh, understand it but I I love being a professor because the students are still being formed they are still forming their perceptions and by letting them know where I come from I hope that if there's any negative perception that a student may have about maybe the people that have the same background as I do, that I'm help, helping shatter uh, all of those negative perceptions by helping them know me a little bit more. And uh, yeah, just showing them, uh, you know, letting them know a little bit about uh, what Latinos are. So it, it is actually makes me full of pride uh, to be a Latino and to teach and to touch so many of you. I want to follow up on that a little bit because, um, yeah, I, I, one of the, going back to why universities are great, uh, I, I completely agree on that, and that is very special at universities. I guess here, you students usually come to learn, to kind of like be formed, um, as, as Father Pete usually says, to become what you're not yet. Um, and, and, and it's a very accepting place, and, and for the most part, like faculties are educated people that have gone and gotten bachelors and masters and most of them PhDs um, and and so it's a, it's a great place to be it's also very different from from other places to work at so for example this experience of, of here be, being able to say my name is and right and, and, and for the students to shatter the, those uh, those bias that they might have about people coming from the same place you're coming or people named similar to you or things like that um, at her work, my wife goes by Iris um, because she was told that her name was too long and that no one wanted to mention Iris Ellis. Um, and, and it has to be Iris, not Iris, which is the Spanish pronunciation. Because um, she sort of like somewhat felt it, sort of like ignored a little bit if, if she didn't fit in with what people wanted to call her. Um, so, so that's, yeah, so, so, so out there. Um, there is still a lot of misinformation and there is still a lot of um, I mean a lot of people that are not maybe on purpose trying to exclude you but because of misinformation they might do it uh, so there is certainly a lot of that and and what I wanted to touch before what I mentioned is so I've heard and maybe some of you have heard the word of institutional or systemic racism and and how could a, could a system be racist or a, 
or an institution be, and, and what do I mean by that? So I, I, I was having conversations a couple of years ago with a couple of people, and, and just to give you an example, so here in Philly, and, and I'll talk about Puerto Ricans because I'm Puerto Rican, so I know a lot about the Puerto Rican community, community in Philadelphia. In North Philly, there is a really, really big Puerto Rican community. Um, in the thousands, large thousands, I forgot the, the, actual, the actual number. Um, and for the most part, it's a low-income community. And here in the United States, the way that schools funding um, works is, I mean, the state provides funding, but also um, depending on the price of your house, part of those taxes go into school funding. So places where houses are expensive, schools get more money. Places where houses are cheap, schools get less money. So you're talking about that a school might have more resources solely based on the fact that it's placed in a neighborhood where people have more money. Um, so where I currently live, which is a little further in Abington, Pennsylvania, the schools have a lot of resources. If I lived in North Philly, um, Schools, you go into the ratings, they're rated 1 out of 10. That means like you have the least resources from all the schools around the area. So that means that you might not get to, to, to teach, to, to get to be in science programs. You might not get to get to do um, pay calculus in high school. You might not get to do a lot of things. Well, what hap if you don't get, if you don't um, take calculus in high school, you might not get accepted into Villanova, for example. Here we don't have pre calculus. You have to come in into calculus if you want to do science. Um, you might not get accept, accepted into Penn. So, so solely based on where you lived and you grew up, that affected the opportunities that you have. So certainly there are places out there where, um, and, and I guess this is mostly talking about income rather than, than race, although um, in this particular, particular case, this low-income community is, is mostly Puerto Rican. Um, so, so yeah, so there are places out there where, where, where you live, where who you are affects the opportunities that you have in life, and, and being, I, I guess, my message is that um, we should be attentive to that, and we should not just throw it out as, oh, how could it be that the way the system works, you know, it's, it's, it's biased or anything like that. Well, it is in, in, in certain cases like this one, the way school funding works. And in fact, there is a group here at Villanova that, that's fighting for, for the Pennsylvania state to redistribute how funding works, and, and uh, Doc, for example, I guess my chair here has been part of meetings, uh, uh, so, so anyways, there are, we can do a different, we, we can make a difference uh, in those sort of things, so, so I encourage you to be attentive to those. So uh, I couldn't agree more, so I, I would not repeat all of that because I think it was perfect, I couldn't say that, say it more clearly. Um, I'll, I'll add two points though. One is about the institutional discrimination that I didn't mean to suggest that there isn't. Of course there is, and there is for all sort of different um, minority groups. Uh, and the, the data is pretty clear, right? So um, you, you can do these experiments where you send an email to professors that the prospective students want to meet, and if the name is a hard to pronounce uh, name from a minority group, then the professors are gonna be less likely to wanna meet with you than if you have an American name. Not because people are evil, but those, those results occur and exist. The same thing for grants and other things. Um, but I think that Alexander brought up a really important point here, which is to what extent this is about race, and to what extent that this is about socioeconomic status. Which, of course, historically, you, you can say, if you are African-American, you are much more likely to be in a low socioeconomic status, and you can trace back this to the history in this country of slavery and so forth. But then, let's think locally. As an institution, should we at Villanova be promoting that there are more Latinos? That's a possibility. Or should we be promoting that there are more people from low socioeconomic status? Now you might think, well, are those two things is kind of the same. Maybe, but maybe not. Because my kid, who is awesome and I adore him, he's also been very privileged because although he is Latino, 
he has all the privileges of being an upper middle class professional family in the mainland. And therefore, he's going to be in a better position to enter Villanova or any other school than the kid in North Philly. And if all you're looking at is race, then you might end up with my kid. And I tell you, he's awesome. But he won't give you the diversity in the socioeconomic status. And that's, I think, is a problem. And second, uh, he uh, doesn't have, I guess, if we can think the role of universities in many different ways. And one of the roles might be one of social mobility, a vehicle to improve your life and the life of your family and your community. My kid is already in third base. So he gonna get to do that. You see how I use a baseball uh, thing? Yeah, you know, we don't have baseball now, you know, whatever. Boring. Um, I digress. My point here is, and this, and I, I think this is an important point that we need to think about is, should we be pushing for more Latinos or should we be pushing for more people from low socioeconomic status? Should we be pushing for blacks or should we be pushing for people with low socioeconomic status? It's an important distinction and it also probably has some impact in the budget, right? because the upper middle class Latinos and Blacks will probably be able to pay full tuition. The kid in uh, North Philly or West Philly will not. And from somewhere that tuition will have to come. And that's an issue that I think we need to be mindful and aware of. Um, you know, it's just to quote, the philosopher Homer Simpson, not only uh, it's very easy to criticize, it's fun to. So I understand that I'm criticizing or I, uh, I, I, I don't have the solutions to it, but I think it's important to be mindful of these of this differences. I, I do want to kind of re relate some of the things that Alexander, Alejandro, uh, <laughs> what, is this one? No. I did want to relate some of the things that uh, uh, Alexander uh, mentioned uh, with uh, some statistics that you showed on the board, because if uh, Latino rich areas don't have enough opportunities at school, then how many of those actually uh, get a high school diploma? How many of them get go to college? How many of them get PhDs, which is what we need uh, to be able to uh, teach uh, uh, at institutions like this one? So then the I think that in a large extent, the number of uh, prof Latino professors, the low numbers of uh, Latino professors is also representing the how many Latinos are in the applicant pool. There's actually uh, well, I was uh, able to be part of, uh, of a search committee for a faculty uh, position that we had in uh, our department, and I was very surprised to see that I think maybe there was one out of maybe almost a hundred that I could uh, recognize as a Latino uh, professor there. So it's that I don't part, so we can talk about, well, maybe it's because uh, we are being uh, discriminated against. Uh, and uh, um, that is, uh, 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 that I'm sure that that happens, but it also those numbers are re a reflection of the very small uh, population of the Latinos that actually, uh, you know, g go as far as uh, uh, the, the degrees that are needed for um, uh, professor positions uh, at uh, colleges and universities. So. so you guys, a lot of you mentioned that uh, kind of students are being formed during their time here at Villanova. And so I kind of want to run with that because I, I completely agree as a student myself. And I think that uh, it would be interesting 
I think it would be interesting to hear from the four of you about how having more of the you know, both students and professors would change the way that students are formed during the time at Villanova and how that may or may not affect uh, the kind of people that we put into the world. I'd like to start with that and probably in five minutes ask you to repeat the question because I'm going to do something you can do as a professor sometimes, which is uh, let me let me change the question and say something else I wanted to say and then we can go back to that. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's a joke, but it does happen. Um, so so I, I completely agree with, with, with um, what both Dilma and um, ah, I'm forgetting Diego. your name, Diego, Diego Duque, um, said. And, and the answer to, to, to the question that Diego posted um, of should we be pushing for more Latinos or more blacks or more people from socioeconomic status? I guess the university has to decide that. I will argue that we need more of all of those. And, 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 and then many institutions everywhere, you're going to hear, oh, we need diversity in terms of race, economic status, this, this, and that. We need diversity, we need diversity. And I hear less and less less about why. Why, why do we need diversity, right? That's, that's a reasonable question to ask. Why Why do we want Villanova to become more diverse? Why do we want other places to become more diverse? And and I, I want to picture, so I guess here at universities we, we're forming the leaders of our country and we really are. When you when you realize and when you realize for example who runs university? Who's, who's our dean? Well it's a faculty. Who's, our deans are faculty. So, so universities are run by faculty. So the faculty we hire run the university, and the students we graduate, they run the companies, they run the world, in a sense, they run politics. Um, so imagine that you're being told, okay, you're a Pennsylvanian for your whole life, or you're from Jersey, and uh, you're now being told, well, now you're going to run uh, the politics in Hawaii. Do you know about Hawaii? Do you know what are the experiences of the people coming from Hawaii? Are you able to make decisions that take into consideration the sort of the, the, the background experiences of the people from Hawaii? No, you might not be aware of that, of, of them, right? So, so we want leaders in our country, we want a leader pool, a leader group that knows who are the people that we're taking decisions for and knows what are their experiences and knows, uh, you know, what affects them and what not. And, and every single person, I cannot know what are the experiences of the people that grew up in North Philly. Even, even if they're Puerto Ricans, I didn't grow up in North Philly, I might not know. Let's alone the people from Jersey, from other places. So you do want to have someone like me, and you do want to have someone like, um, that's you know, from, from Philly, and you do want to have someone that's from Jersey, and you do want to have diversity in the group of people that makes decision, because that will make your group better informed about um, the different experiences and backgrounds of, of, um, of the people that your decisions will affect. Um, so, so yes, we, and, and, and on, on the second point of, okay, yes, okay, diversity is important, we want diversity, how do we achieve that, right, um, and, and, yeah, that's another question, right, because if you do accept, as you said, people from so, low socioeconomic status, we still faculty get paid, you know, money has to come from somewhere, the university needs to run, um, so it's not an easy question, you need support from different places, and, and I don't have all the answers either, but, but, it is worth, it's, it's a question worth asking, it's, and it's a question, of, it, it's worth looking for those resources, because you do want to have a world where the people that make decisions know what are the backgrounds and what are the sort of things that affect those people that you're making decisions for, or that your decisions affect. Um, so, so that was my message, and then can you repeat the question? Because <laughs> that was not the question you asked. Okay, okay, uh, I'll let others in. So, um, coming to your question, and was Alejandro just said, I think one of the key points here, or at least how I see it, is to define diversity. Uh, and I think that's one of the issues that we're talking about. Uh, I don't think we just need more Latinos. I think we just need more diversity. And how do you define diversity? I think it's an open question nowadays uh, because uh, I, I think we want to learn and we want to we have leaders, we want to have people from everywhere. And not only geographically, but also social, I mean, uh, economically, um, different backgrounds, etc. And how do you get that? How do you promote that? Uh, were you aware? Are you aware of the case on Harvard? There was an issue in Harvard recently where they got sued uh, because of favoring. Uh, I think it was uh, low income or uh, any particular race. I forgot the details, but I remember they were sued uh, for um, uh, regular students 
that they didn't have uh, enough uh, window for them to get into Harvard. Asian, uh, Asian American. Asian, okay. Asian American. Asian American, that's true, yeah, that's correct. Um, so I think one of the questions, the uh, most important questions to me is how can we define diversity in one single scale? Because one of the risks that I see nowadays is that we're putting labels and we're putting people in different boxes. So forget about all these boxes, try to make one single scale and try to have everyone from the different uh, uh, orders of magnitude. At least that would be my approach. So I don't know what you think about that. But um, how to define the scale? Uh, that's a challenge. I don't know how to do it, honestly. <coughs> Yeah, right. It's it's hard to 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 define. So so I think every single institution, every single place you're at, has to define what do we want to become. What are the students that we want? Um, who are like does Villanova want to have a hundred percent European student, a hundred percent Asian students? We want to have um, a population that um, that is reflective of the population of the U.S. So so those are all hard. I mean, you have so there's no one clear answer. So. Institutions have to have to think about um, who do we serve, who do we want to become, where are we where are we at, and and then make that decision. So, for example, a benchmark that I hear often for universities in the U.S. is, well, at least you would like your population to reflect kind of like the population of the U.S., or at least maybe your population of students from the U.S. should reflect the population of the U.S. Um, and and that could be one 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 benchmark of. of Diversity, so like, yeah, I want a little bit of everything, or maybe you want more. Yeah, so so it's it's, it's every it, there's no one right answer, I think, but every institution has to decide who they want to become, and and the hard part is how you get there. You may want to ask questions. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna turn it over to you all. I don't know if anyone has any questions today they would like to ask our distinguished panelists. about diversity in Villanova like at the moment and what has been your experience uh, being here? Excellent question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll let others answer, but again. So I have been here only for one and a half years, so um, I don't know how about it's my answer, but um, most important thing is that I feel very welcome. Uh, so, as a Latino person, as I identify myself, I feel very welcome. That's super important to me. So, I don't feel that any discrimination. And, and it's true that um, that when you look at the statistics, it says that the number of students that are uh, from minorities is not that high. But uh, as a faculty here, I don't see any discrimination in the class where I teach or the research that I do. Uh, behind the scenes, I don't know what is happening, uh, but at least from from what I see, I don't see anything affecting that. I don't know what your perspective. Is. Uh, did you want to say something? So, well, speaking only from the point of view of what I see in my classroom, because that uh, I mean, being in the in the sciences, that may be completely different from what it looks like uh, at the at the dining hall, for example. Um, but I am comparing what I have here with other institutions that I thought, I, I would say I like the diversity here because it is not just, um, well, mostly uh, white students and then just one specific other group. There is a mixture. The diversity is diverse. Uh, although that varies from semester to semester, but it's nice to see, you know, like so many uh, different uh, students 
that look like they come from different places. And I love that. And I also love how, at least again in my class, they work really well together. You don't see students like turning their backs uh, on another student just because it looks uh, different from the way I look. And I, I think that the Villanova st students are like that. I, like uh, he said, I have felt very welcomed here uh, and appreciated, which I have to say it hasn't been the case in uh, at this, uh, other places that I've been. Uh, so I think that Villanova students are very special. And um, yes, it can be more diverse, but I like how it is uh, di there's diversity in, in the way that you guys are diverse. Oh, yeah, I, I love it here. I love my job. I love the institution. I think people at Villanova um, care about you as a person. Um, I, I love my students. Um, in mathematics, I guess the courses I've been teaching, for example, when I teach our majors, um, I gotta say that, yeah, for the, it's, for the most part, the classroom is not diverse in terms of race, perhaps not in terms of social economic status. That's harder to, to, to pin down or not. But, um, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with any of you. You're all great. All of the Villanova students are great. I love them. You're, 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 you know, you like to learn. You're hard workers. You, you challenge us to be better teachers. Um, there is absolutely nothing wrong with any single Villanova student or with the population of students here um, at, at Villanova. Um, that being said, I do want the student population, for example, to become more diverse. Not because there is anything wrong with the current students, but because we need other people to have access to the resources that Villanova provides for the reasons that I, that I mentioned um, before, because we need other people to be able to then launch and, and have great careers and affect the people of others and be able to understand them. But, but not because there's anything wrong with, with any of you. So, so I, I absolutely love um, being here. I love my, my colleagues. Um, uh, I felt very welcome. So um, yeah, it's a great place to be. So I will we'll say the following. Uh, in my department, psychological and brain sciences, never felt any discrimination. People are really great. Um, and I think throughout the uh, university, I always felt that way. You know, I was talking to my wife saying, you know, they, one of the questions is how you've been negatively affected. And I, I haven't noticed any, I don't know what to say. She said, well. I'm sure you'll come up with something, Diego. You always talk even if you don't have anything to say. Uh, but anyhow, um, but here's the other thing. So at the level of faculty, I think the in my department at least, who is the people I know, they've always been very uh, welcoming. The administration, has, the, the little that I interacted, always been very welcoming. Villanova has, if my understanding is that one of their priorities institutionally is diversity. So clearly the university is saying this is important to us. And I believe each individual from faculty to administration, they genuinely believe that. The question is how do we make it happen? What and it's gonna cost money, and that's the issue I think where where it gets tricky. How do we make it happen? So, uh, how are we gonna bring those kids from West Philly to Villanova or from North Philly or from okay? And then at that point it's like well then. But there, there are obstacles, and of course there are obstacles. So one obstacle that has been brought to my attention is that sometimes those students are not um, well prepared academically. And I suggested, well, maybe we should go into the high schools or maybe the middle schools. But you know, that's, that's an undertaking for a university. But maybe there are other more uh, simpler solutions. For example, one thing that has been proposed recently at the federal level is that every kid in the United States takes the SAT paid in the school, in high school. Because that would help identify many kids who are really smart, who currently don't take the SATs, 
and therefore go under the radar. Okay. Now, it's conceivable that Villanova could go to, to some high schools in West Philly or North Philly and say, here, we're going to put a $30,000 grant so that in your high school, every kid takes the SAT. And from there, we're going to identify those who are high uh, scoring and therefore have the aptitude to succeed. That would cost $30,000 a year. That's not a lot of money. That's half of a tuition. The problem is, what do you do once you identify those, um, those students? Because then if they cannot pay, who pays? And there's where the tension comes, right? If we want diversity, we need to be willing as an institution to pay for it. And I think that there is where it gets, where, where maybe the answer is not as uh, rosy as, as uh, we know, like, well, we're all for diversity. Anyhow, you might wonder why hasn't the administration done anything about this? Well, because I just came up with this this weekend in my head when I was reading an article about it. So I haven't told anybody until I told you guys now. So you're the first one to hear. So no one to blame, but what I'm saying is that there might be concrete steps and that should be, what should be our criterion to see, to decide has Villanova, three years from now, can we say that Villanova has increased its diversity? It should be more students from diverse backgrounds, right? And, uh, and if three years from now we have another uh, panel like this one and the numbers look the same, then this was a lot of fun, we felt pretty good about it, but really we fell short. So you have three years. Any other questions? Anyone else have a question? I have a question. Um, actually, going off of that, I was wondering if there's any other suggestions that any of you had for how to increase um, Latino students at the Latino student population at Villanova beyond the SAT suggestion. Um, and also, like, I'm a staff person here, but I've noticed that most of the Latino students that we do have at Villanova aren't from the Philly area, so not from North Philly or West Philly or South Philly or Norristown, which is right up the like corner but um and has a large latino population but there's hardly any of those students here um so kind of like two-part question like any other suggestions and then specifically looking at the local area what could we do to reach out to highly latino neighborhoods so uh, i have one suggestion so who are the best ambassadors of the university students right so you guys and girls are are the ones that can spread the voice about how, how cool, how fun, uh, how challenging it is to come to the Lanova. So, I mean, of course, faculty, we, we can do our part. Uh, but I think uh, students, I mean, if, if you see a friend or someone that you trust, or you recommend it to go to this dentist, you're going to trust your friend, and you're going to go to the dentist that your friend recommend you, right? Uh, the same applies for universities. If you hear about the Lanova, and uh, a very good recommendation, you feel welcome, you're Latino, you might consider to visit the Lanova for a campus visit, right? Okay. Uh, so that could be one, one possibility. Yeah, I agree that, I mean, for the most part, uh, we do want students thinking about coming to Villanova to talk to the students of Villanova and, 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 and you guys, when you do tours and girls, when you do tours and things like that, you certainly affect, um, uh, and, that, and that, that's a good part of, of um, trying to convince people to come. Um, I guess a question even be, uh, an issue before that is, do we actually get to interact with this, with, with the local students? Um, and I don't have the data of that, I'm fairly new here, I don't have, but one thing, if it's not being done, one thing that could be done is to um, reach out and invite high schools to bring their students to Villanova. So for example, I, for a summer, I I help at a, at a community college in North Philly that's called Esperanza College. It's actually part of Eastern University, but it's kind of like a small community college that helps the students there uh, start taking some classes and then they transfer to Esperanza. 
and and there was one student who was taking a calculus one course there, and 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 I, I said, you you should come to Villanova, um, and her response was, I will never ever be able to go to Villanova, and. I, I said, I don't think that's true. Um, I mean, either way she was transferring to Esperanza. But it might be that actually some of these people might not think they can get to Villanova. They might not even, I mean, it might not have crossed their mind to think, yeah, college, Villanova. Do you know wh why she thought um, that? Well, there, the, I assume, I didn't ask um, why, because other things happen. I assume it has to do with probably thinking that it's very expensive, that it's very selective, that, um, so, so, for example, when I was an undergrad myself, and I was um, thinking about grad school, it took a lot of people to tell me, you should, okay, yeah, you're, I, I will apply to these places, I told them, and it took a lot of people to tell me, oh, but you should also apply to MIT just in case. And I was like, ah, I'm not getting into MIT coming from the University of Puerto Rico. Um, just because you don't, I mean, you might not believe that, yeah, you have, you have the background, the resources, and things like that to go to those places, and no one tells you, yeah, I think you do. So, so, so maybe us reaching and saying, yeah, let's invite these students from this high school, and let's have them do a campus tour. And once you're here, you can be like, oh, this is a really nice campus, maybe, yeah, let's, let's apply for it. Or things like so I think if we reach out a little bit more, and then, yeah, we'll need certainly students and, and our staff and all of that to, to say good things about Villanova. And then we'll need also to learn how that student will be able to afford Villanova. Because Villanova is expensive. And the reality is that, you know, my wife is in the big sister, big, little sister, big brother, big sister program. And she has a little sister and she's adorable and she's in whatever. She's 10 years old and she lives in West Philly. And she can't afford coming to Villanova. I mean, Villanova is not an option um, because Villanova costs sixty-five thousand dollars a year. Um, so, a, a, another concrete uh, step that would be useful is the following: Villanova gives a tuition remission to faculty and staff. That's great um, for recent hires, uh, which I think I don't remember is the last 10 years or 15 years, uh, instead of being totally free, it is now, I think, 15% of the tuition, which is still a bargain, right? Especially for a professor like me, which we have a household, in, household income on the six figures, because the expected family contribution for somebody like me is relatively high, so Villanova 15% of the tuition Sounds really uh, great. Much of our staff comes uh, because they're lower paying jobs, you know, janitors and cooks and so forth. Um, they are disproportionately minority compared to, I don't know, I don't have the numbers. Uh, uh, for them, however, the 15% of the tuition is rather steep because as a percentage of the salary, that they earn is much more than the percentage for me or for, for anyone at this table. So a concrete uh, solution or a concrete problem to, to overcome here would be to change the rule so that below a certain uh, salary, you can make it, you know, 50,000, that cuts pretty much everybody at this table, um, I would imagine. Um, but uh, based that those uh, staff would have a zero pay, and maybe that has to come from the us at the table instead of paying fifteen percent, paying twenty or twenty-five. I don't know how to balance the budget. Uh, and if you have that, then you can then do a little more of reach out. I don't know how well known among the staff, especially the staff that doesn't interact in the academics, not so much secretaries, but you know, janitors and cooks, uh, how well it is known that this is an option. That would be a population that, in principle, could, um, we could recruit. So that's, that's a concrete idea. 
because I'm very angry, but actually I always talk like this. You gotta see me watching the Villanova game. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, something that, that has been thrown around, um, and, and yeah, uh, is that the university is developing a new strategic plan that I guess faculty at the very least have gotten emails last semester, I got a few about meetings where you can share your ideas and things like that. So I read a little bit. And part of that is the university is trying to meet 100% of the financial need. I think they, we now meet 85% of the financial need of a student. So if a student, if there's, I guess, every institution has its magic formula of saying, okay, your family makes this much, okay, you have this many resources, you are about, you can pay this much about the university, you know, this much for tuition, so the rest we're going to cover, the university covers up to 85%. Um, and, and for example, I used to work at Swarthmore, and they have their own formula for that. Um, and um, the university, I guess, is trying to, to now meet 100%, which is the same problem solving. Where does the money come from? So it has to, um, you know, it's... The university has to has to run fundraisers and things like that. So so that that I assume might help um, will help in that uh, those that for example cannot pay anything, then if you do get financial assistance, I mean the university it, uh, can provide one hundred percent rather than eighty five. Um, so so maybe that is that is a, that is something that will help towards this. Um, I don't think there is one thing that will magically turn Villanova into, you know, the, the most diverse place. It really takes time, it really takes effort, it takes saying, yeah, let's try to have the, 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 the sons and daughters of the staff, and that will bring in a few maybe students a year, and let's try to reach out to high school, and maybe those high schools will bring three or four a year, and then, and so, so there is no magic solution to this, again, because also money is involved, so, so for sure it's going to, it's going to take some time. F. Fierro's at a recent meeting, F. Fierro's is our College of Literary Arts and Science Di Diversity. Uh, yeah, but he's titled, he's a dean. I'm not sure if he's assistant or associate, associate dean of diversity. Um, he said another thing, so, so one has to be careful. Maybe Villanova right now can say, okay, let's actually solve this problem immediately, okay? We have enough students applying even more after we won the, the NCAA, the, the basketball championship for some reason, right? Our faculty became more amazing. No, I guess the, <laughs> the university became uh, more well-known. So we have a lot of students applying. Let's actually say, period, we are going to accept this many from the incoming class that are coming from this background, whether it's race, socioeconomic status, whatever. We're going to accept them, period, forget about it. How do you support them then? Do we have the resources to support them? If you accept students that are underprepared, and you th throw them into COC 1 because we don't have anything else. I guess if you're in science, it's, it's not going to go well for the most part. And then the university will look really bad because, yeah, you accepted students, you didn't support them, so it's not good for the students and it's not good for the institution. So I guess it is this balancing of we got to make, we got to keep pushing, keep pushing and make sure we make progress, but making sure that we don't actually do just the opposite and kind of like, um, do a disservice to our students. So, so it takes ideas and just the conversation to keep going and the universities to be able to say, okay, yes, let's try to provide 100% assistance. Let's try to accept a few more students. And let's try this and let's try that. And let's give more resources to CASA, um, which is the center for, so I want to try CASA. Okay, everyone calls it CASA. Um, people will know what it means. So it's a center that provides help, not just to students from socioeconomic status, actually for to all students, but certainly if you're coming out prepared, um, CASA can help. So let's provide them more resources um, and things like that. So, so it, it requires just a constant push of trying to get better um, every, every year. I just want to add one other thing. I think a very first step that would be great is to have all the information in one place, to have transparency, where you can click and see what is the policy? Because you don't know what is the policy. I've been here for 15 years. I don't know what the policy is. Now, I haven't been looking for it, but it shouldn't be that a faculty or a student needs to go asking three different or four different uh, staff to find out what is the, 
the the support that a student would get in term in terms of their needs. So you go to the MIT website and you have the calculator and you put your family income and it tells you how much you have to pay for it. Any of you can go, MIT, look at it. And it, oh, a lot of schools do this. There is no reason why we couldn't have do that. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm here again telling people to do other, other stuff, right? I mean, to do the work. I'm going home. I'm not working on this tomorrow. I appreciate that. But uh, I think a transparency would be really useful. So on the question of whether Villanova will I believe that Villanova currently, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, is need sensitive but not need blind. Is that correct? So if a student he cannot afford the expected family contribution, I don't know what happens. So maybe some of those who have more institutional memory or know more things can, can comment on that. Um, so when, when you're saying that it's aiming to be a hundred percent, does that mean that it would be then need blind? Yes. Not know. Yes. It means um, to meet a hundred percent of demonstrated financial need. Right now we need about eighty percent. And and that, that that's an average. Right, right, and that would be met in terms of uh, with grants or with, with grants. loans. With grants. Right, right. That would be terrific. So that's the goal. That, right. So that is, a, that is awesome that the, the administrations have come out and said, this is our goal. And I think the, the goal for, for all of us is to try to achieve those, those goals. So I'm trying to lose weight, so I count my calories every day. It's not going that well. But at least I am trying to to push myself to do that. And so that's a concrete goal that we can, um, that we can aspire to. It's going to require $30 million more each year, financially. It's going to require $30 million more each year. So that gives you, and this is important, because here I've been like, oh, we need more, we need more. Well, where do those $30 million come from? I mean, this is not that the administration is like, Colors is that somebody needs to balance the budget, right? I mean that's important to be said. Otherwise, it might be misconstrued that you know that people and the administration don't care. I'm sure they do care, but they also need to balance the budget. Um, so you know these are these are important things. Another thing that is important here is, and this goes back to the, the to the previous point I was making. Fifteen percent for is different when you are poor. When you are poor. You can't afford 15%. 5% might be too, too much of a barrier. In a way that if you are middle class, then uh, it, it isn't the case. So those are real, real barriers, I think. Yeah, I mean, if you do, we all know what the federal minimum is. So imagine that you, know, you have two parents or one parent making the federal minimum. You make the computations eight hours a week. Uh, eight hours a day, 40 hours uh, a week. Um, you multiply by the number of weeks in a year, you know what what a person can make. Is it 20,000 a year? Um, and, and you have to survive with that. And then you're talking, can I pay 5%? Yeah, it is, yeah, yeah I completely agree. I mean, 5% of tuition here for some people is way too much. And, um, and people might say, well, but it's unfair because, well, if I have more money, I have to pay more. Well, that seems very equitable to me, you know, if you have more, you have more, I mean, you can give yourself the opportunity to, 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 to come here. If you don't, imagine, if, yeah, so like I, I often try to put myself, which is, you know, you, you're never going to be able to completely understand people, but um, if I think of myself as, what if I was raised in North Italy? What, what if I had no resources, the schools that I went to had no resources? What if I... If, if um, I, I didn't have the mentors that I had in my lab, what if? So, so I guess as you go on in life and as, as you do your own things and great things in life, be sensitive, be sensitive to people, to where people are coming from. Uh, and if you don't know, don't make assumptions. That's one of the hardest things to do. Our minds, we, we're just biased by our, by our 
um, experiences and 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 when for example just to give you an example when faculty are looking for are looking at applicants or people are looking at applicants at a of a job when you see a name that's very unfamiliar or that you know it, that that might hint you might be like well I don't I don't I'm not gonna look into it so there there are biases that come into play as you as you do your things in life because our experiences do shape who we are um, and the best thing we can do is try to catch ourselves and be like no wait you know I gotta be fair or I don't know about this let me ask or so as you go on in life and and, and have to deal with your own diversity issues whatever is it that you're at and whatever diversity means at those places places just be sensitive and be honest with yourself and and, um, and and make sure that if you don't know you ask and if you catch yourself trying to 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 sort of like um, cut the corner and be like oh catch yourself and be like no no I gotta be fair things like that so um, it's not easy but I think that um, it's it's good practice I just mentioned one other thing that you can do concretely you can try to convince grandma to not vote for racist. That's something you can do. On that note, I would love to thank everyone so much for coming out today.